Hello, good afternoon everyone. Uh, welcome to the Just Join IT channel. Uh, this time we are talking in English. So for all of the people who are listening our uh, videos mostly in Polish, sorry for that, you have to stay focused. And uh, today mm, we are going to talk with Paco van Bekoven, who is working for Open Value. Uh, which uh, as a consultant and he's helping picnic uh, doing their work am i right or did i yeah. mess up something no no, no that's excellent excellent I call it, i'm helping picnic with the last mile delivery because that sounds more fancy oh yeah definitely <laughs> so um, paco we meet today because um, you are going to present uh, at uh, infoshare f3 conference next week on thursday if i see it correctly uh, it's uh, on the red stage and uh, the hour of your presentation is uh, half past one yes correct yeah, everything so correct um, we talking about mutation testing which is uh have you ever heard about it yeah i've heard about it uh, but it's really not common in the front end uh, environment let's say well, because i'm a front end engineer you are mostly working with uh, what kind of technologies yeah so um I, I call myself a full stack, but I think the last uh, couple of projects were mostly uh, to backend. Um, but mutation testing is, is, I mean, it's most often used in the backend, but there are nowadays also tools for the front end, which makes it extra interesting because I think, especially in the front ends, unit testing can use, unit tests can use some extra log. Cool. Uh, like, uh... You, you mentioned that uh, your presentation will be about mutation testing. Can you briefly describe what, uh, what is it and uh, what benefits you will get if you introduce uh, mutation testing into your code base? Why you want to do that? Yes. Yeah. So uh, mutation testing is about uh, testing your tests. So you want to, um, what you're basically going to do with mutation testing is you're going to break the code. So you're going to automatically introduce bugs and then you're going to run the test and see if the tests fail. Because if you introduce a bug like inverting an if statement and the code, the tests do not fail, that means that your tests are not complete um, or maybe not asserting the right things. And that's where mutation testing helps. So basically, um, you have code coverage. Code coverage is already a good metric, uh, but mutation testing is sort of the extra step on top of it to also check if you're, for example, asserting the right things and whether your test actually makes sense. And that ha can help you in creating more confidence in your test suite, which can help you uh, deliver less bugs. And less bugs is always good because it saves money, and uh, which and then also increases confidence. That's uh, a yeah, good thing so to do. Sounds really promising. Uh, like, are those mutations uh, based on? Like, I assume that this is not just randomizing the uh, text structure of your code. It's it's based on some AST or some more clever yeah. stuff. Yeah, so in, indeed, uh, the code must compile, so it only does sensible changes. Um, for Java, for example, does it in the bytecode. Um, and actually, you have a set of mutators, and each mutator does uh, certain changes. And each mutator, each each single change is a single mutant. So for example, you have a mutator that changes uh, if one, if i is more than 10, then you do something, then the mutator will invert it, is more than into less or equal than. Oh. So you you just swap it around, or if uh, if one plus two it changes into one minus two, and then um, so it does it like that. It can remove void statements. So if you have a, a, a call to another surface, which doesn't influence the structure of your code, so you don't need the return value, then it just um, removes those and checks if your test will pick that up. So for example, are you asserting whether you actually called the surface? Okay, so, so uh, let, let, let's not get more technical. Uh, yeah, exactly. here. yeah, this is just yeah. like a, a taste of what uh, will be the presentation that you are going to perform next week. Yeah. Um, I will also, uh, a nice thing in the presentation, I will also talk a bit more about when you should or shouldn't use it. So definitely come to the talk and you'll also be able to ask more questions about uh, the topic. Yeah, so let's not spoil the fun. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, good luck with, with your presentation next week. Um, Thank you. But, but today we are uh, we meet basically to talk uh, more about the consulting uh, itself, right? Like, uh, how the career of uh, IT consultant looks like. And uh, I remember during your introductory video for the F3 conference, you mentioned that uh, it wasn't uh, 
clear from the beginning what you are go what you will be doing uh, when you started your career like you were kind of fan of um, uh, flash flash games if i remember correctly <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, as a kid, I mean, so I'm 30 years old, so around 18, I think it was uh, late, late 2008, 2007, Flash was super popular. So yeah, of course, all the Flash games, but also brands like Coca-Cola had these amazing immersive experiences that looked super awesome, where you could click around and you see all the, the magical things go, uh, appear. I and remember I thought... the page, like it was called Too Advanced, if I remember correctly. They, they made some insanely uh, complex animations on, on their website. Like, uh, I don't know, not, not sure if you remember this page. No, no. I, I, there was I a lot of stuff no. like that, yeah. But I also uh, wasn't really that much into it. It's mostly, I saw these things, I thought, oh, that's Flash. And it sounded, it looked really awesome. And I thought maybe I can do that. Um, but when I started my study, so the Flash is more focused on multimedia design and communication, which is more for, um, I would say more for the front end, but also more the creative side of things. And it quickly turned out that I'm not really a fan of the creative part, but more of the implementation part, which made uh, um, computer science more of a, a, a better match. Um, and also I think it was a good decision because Flash turned out not to be the greatest thing. Oh yeah, they invented. <laughs> I remember some some last time, uh, like last minute projects trying to migrate from Flash to web technologies. Uh, it was last year, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask um, when you figured it out and uh, why you decided to go more into like that kind of backend implementation part of the of the development. What was the mo main motivator for that? Um, yeah, so I had a, a study counselor, I think it's called. So somebody who helps you uh, at your study. Um, and he also mentioned, sort of advised it, that it would fit more in my, I would say, profile. But I just really liked the programming part better. Uh, and the communication study actually also included things like uh, courses on writing and courses on um, uh, designing things. And that's not what I like, especially not the writing part that seemed awful yeah then writing text so not writing code but writing commercial text like um yeah like, i mean like just doing the copy right so for the website yeah, exactly so, horrible yeah. don't want to do that i mean i respect the people who can do that but it's not my thing and that's when i decided computer science it's it's also a lot more clear i would say that's also why i have a slight preference for the back end is that um the scope for the front end feels endless, where for the back end sort of feels a bit more close. You need to you have APIs, for example, right? Yeah, there. definitely less uh, subjective, let's say, uh, because like exactly. from the front end perspective, like it needs to look correctly, it needs to behave correctly, it needs to work on different machines, and you have to like account for all the front end develop um, environments that uh, run your application. So yeah, definitely a back end from this perspective seems like a much a uh, pleasant way to be a uh, pleasant place to be uh, when everything yeah, yeah it runs Definitely. um so uh, regarding uh, like the topic of your presentation um how much of your like actual um, let's say percentage of work is focused on doing the mutation testing stuff i i assume this is some kind of addition but maybe i i'm wrong um so how much of my work is actually about a mutase testing yeah it is actually, actually an interesting one um because mutase testing uh, and that's what you also hear during the presentation there are projects for which it works and projects for which it doesn't really work i mean which are not suitable for it uh and then i don't mean technically but more in the way the team is set up or the project is set up uh from an organizational perspective and uh, so i work as a consultant i come to customers and the last couple of projects, there wasn't really um, interest in for it. I did uh, implement it, for example, did a demo, and then you uh, you find some things, which is a nice starting point. But if you don't find enough because the project is already has great quality, um, it's not super useful. It wasn't super useful for them. And I mean, so I don't work at these companies, which also mean I didn't want to force it on them um because as a consultant you also move away which means that maybe the support for it would also move away so i don't want to didn't want to go there mm -hmm. uh, uh, my first job we used it a lot 
uh, yeah, I, I want to ask uh, how much freedom do you have uh, if it comes to picking the projects? Is it like a project arise and you have to go to it or like open value is giving you like more freedom to pick? Like I definitely want to work for it or not. Um, yeah, so uh, I think it really depends on the company you're working at, but at open value, we have uh, lots of freedom. Uh, for example, we uh, in April last year, so I was working actually for Google, which was really awesome, a place you normally wouldn't really get into. I was there as an external, um, but the project was suddenly canceled. And um, I think within a week, I had intakes at five or six different companies. Um, so basically, they just give you like, hey, you want to go here and here and here, and then you just have interviews with companies, and then you can sort of pick yourself which one you prefer. So they are not going to be like, oh, this one gets you this amount of per hour and this one gets you this amount per hour. You should go for this one because it's more. No, you have the freedom there to pick. The pleasure is, is the most important thing because that also makes, um, if you like the project, you're also more committed to it and you're also more willing to stay there, for example, longer. Uh, so we have lots of freedom in terms of, in that sense. And we can also, if we don't like a project anymore, we can just say it's time to move on. So I, spend, for example, one and a half year at one place. And at some point I think, okay, now I've, I've seen it, um, time for something new. And then you slowly start searching for a new project and you can, then, and then you switch over. Uh, yeah, so you, lots of free. You, you mentioned really interesting part, like uh, landing in the companies like Google uh, as an external. Uh, how is it like, actually? Because I, I, I'm, I kind of feel that um, there is some kind of onboarding process for people who are hired directly. How it looks for uh, the consultant? Is it like the same stuff or? Are you talking specifically about Google now? Uh, yeah, we can talk if, if we can talk oh. about that. Um, no, so uh, I think that um, the process of onboarding as an external is slightly different as if you're actually going to work there. In my experience, I had less interviews. So usually when you, for example, go to also a place like Picnic, you have three, four, maybe five interviews, or same for Google, by the way. Um, but somehow, and that also I think has to do with the reputation of the consultancy firm. So as Open Value, we we're like a small company, but we have a focus on on, on yeah, high performing, uh, lots of quality. We're also on lots of conferences, so we sort of um, the trust is that we're good developers, which means that the intakes are usually more about are you a match for the company rather than that they are testing your skill set. Um, and if they want, because and that's their advantage, if you don't perform or they don't feel like it's working for them, they can just say goodbye. And then a month later, um, you have to look for a new assignment. I mean, it goes two ways. Cool. So yes, the, the, the interviews are definitely, I think I would say it's easier to get into places. So because, because you have like different starting points, right? Yeah, exactly. And also, in, indeed, the, the context there, and actually the fun part is then if you would, I mean, in theory, if you would really like the company, then you could, I mean, you're still a consultancy, you're not supposed to then go work for them, but it's then easier to actually get into the company as well, because they already know you, you've already worked there, and you can make a switch in theory, if you, if you would want it. Um, have you ever uh, heard that, like, actually, uh, I, I tried to rephrase the question. Uh, like there are two terms regarding working from outside. Uh, like you, you can be a consultant or a contractor. Like what's the difference? Is there any? Oh, um, or is it like philosophical question that we can skip? <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure if I actually I know the difference. I do. I mean, I can. Is it the difference like between a consultancy firm and working as a freelancer? I think so. Like, I'm not quite sure. Like, uh, I just heard that there are some differences. I, w I was curious if uh, like, you ever met with uh, such questions, like, are you a consultant or a like, contractor? If not, like, we can, we can skip this topic. Uh, no, no, actually, I haven't. Uh, usually, we use the term, are you external or internal are usually the questions you get. Oh, um, cool. So it's more or less. So that. Like when when you are joining the the company, like they have some internal structures, they have uh, probably a lot of uh, internal culture. Uh, how how do you enter this kind of team, and what things you find like the most difficult uh, during this process? Um, that's a good question uh, because indeed, so basically, I switch every year, so you get new team, new culture. Um, well, you learn to adopt, basically. Um, I think that's also one of the challenges is that if you're super strongly opinionated, it can be hard because you have sort of a something in your head 
and you go to a company, you see all these things, and it's like, oh no, I don't like that, I don't like that, I don't like that. Um, then you can do two things: you can try to change it, or you can try to adapt. Um, and it really depends on the company what the best strategy is there, though. Um, but yeah, you just have to ad adapt to the culture. You get to know new people, but it's the same as if you have a new colleague in your team. So. Um, and in most companies, actually, because there's also always this thing like, is an external treated differently as an internal person? Um, and so far, in my experience, I haven't seen any differences, which is a really nice uh, way because it means you really feel like part of the company. So I personally actually am somebody, as soon as I walk into an office, I start speaking in the we term. Um, as easy as I was at uh, my first job last weekend, and I started talking about we again, even though I haven't worked there for four years. So I quite easily sort of blend in and feel uh, at home at a company quite quickly. Um, but it's part of uh, being a consultant is to yeah, be able yeah. to quickly adapt to the new situation. That, that was one of my next questions. Uh, like, uh, <laughs> do you ever encountered some uh, like problems uh, blending in? Uh, but you already said that uh, you had the luck of not encountering this kind of issues. Yeah, and I, I, but it's also the personality, I think. So I'm, I'm not really on for it. In for a confrontation, so usually I um, accept and adapt to the situation. I mean, you can always suggest improvements, but um, it's always their decision. It's also a bit of the distance, of course, with consultancy. I don't work there. If they really, really want things, if they say, um, we have to do it this way and you can't convince them, then it's, for me, it's okay, um, but it's your problem and I'll be gone in a year or maybe in a couple of months. Uh, cool. Uh like when you are blending in, uh, basically uh, you need to gather a lot of information to, for your job. So a lot of stuff you can find probably in the documentation if the company provi like provides you with this uh, stuff. Yes, yes. But there is a lot of uh, tribal knowledge. Do you have any tricks on tips uh, how to extract this tribal knowledge or uh, what you have to be careful for? Yeah, so that's actually an interesting one. You see lots of different onboarding processes. So I've been at places where after three weeks I finally was able to do something. Uh, because you were waiting for passwords to set up or access to things like Nexus, which is, for example, a dependency tool. Um, some places really don't have their, really need to improve there. Um, and some really have it in place. Um, and it also depends on documentation. So what I typically do is, uh, I prefer is that once you're in, you first start getting a bit of an introduction, of course, with your new teammates, try to talk to all of them, and then you just start working on the smaller tasks and always um, try to sort of force yourself to do things. So it's quite easily in the beginning to think, I don't know how this works. This will be for someone else. Just um, even if it's a hard task, just pick it up and just keep on asking to collect. Don't be afraid to ask. I think that's the most important part is that um, you can spend the week on yourself trying to figure out by yourself how the application works, where you can also ask somebody to just tell you give you pointers where to be, maybe do it together. That's also a very, uh, a good tip I would say is to just do lots of pair programming as well in the beginning, just to get to know the code base, get to see how they work, get to see the process from how does it go from an issue to an actual pull request to merging it, to getting it to production. Seeing all those steps quite early um, is really helpful because that means you, because as a consultant, you have to get up to speed a bit more. You're expected to be a bit more faster up to speed so, so as a sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> no, go on. Uh, so, do you keep track of uh, some kind of records, like how fast I was able to uh, commit to develop, like um, to make a commit that lands on production in given company? Like, who has the the fastest uh, onboarding process and lets you just contribute to production? Yeah, yeah I think that's fifty percent is that on the developer and fifty percent is on the company because I've also been in places where it took me two weeks to even be able to send a commit or access the code. So that's not really a fair start. If the other place, everything is already in place. And within oh, yeah. a day, I like get picnic. I think within a week, I was able to commit, uh, build everything. Um, those are typically the first steps, try to get to build the project. And it also depends on how quickly the company goes to production. Uh, some just release weekly, some do daily, some do it never. Oh. And those are the great <laughs> ones. Yeah, it happens. Uh, uh, yeah, I wanted to ask one question. I just forgot about it. So I will just look at the questions that uh, arrive uh, in the comments under this video. 
uh, Kaya is asking um, a really interesting question. Like, if not IT consultant, what are the alternatives for a hungry senior developer? So someone just perceives the, the I, like the being the IT consultant as some kind of uh, extension for the career. How do you feel it? Uh, so, so as a what kind of senior? Uh, uh, hungry, uh, sorry, um, I hunger, uh, maybe my English is not perfect here. Like if you are starving, uh, then you're a hungry ah, developer. Okay, okay. Like, yeah. I think, uh, starving for well, challenges, let's say. Ah, okay, okay, check, yeah. sorry. Um, yeah, so w looking at a career perspective, I think consultancy is a, a way to level up your career because you see many different flings, places and problems. Um, one way to describe is you have people that stay at the same company for 10 years. Maybe they switch teams. That's always, of course, a good alternative, but you're always stuck with the same stack, the same technology. Um, you actually just see one way of, solu of to solve things. But if you switch companies, say, each year, and as a, a consultant, that's sort of easy because you just move from project to project. You don't have to relocate and do all the other things. Um, you see different stacks, different ways to organize things. And then when you get to the third one, you see, hey, um, the way they do their uh, pull request reviews here is a lot different from where they did it in the first company. And I think that the first company is actually doing some smart things that you can then take to the third company and help them. And that goes on and on. So you keep getting more experience. You see companies that, hey, they, they do this sort of perspective, this part of the process really well. Um, and then you you basically learn it. You see all these different processes and all these different tools, languages, frameworks so that you can, um, if you go to a new company or start a new project, it would be easier to pick certain technologies because you've seen, okay, I've seen this work here, but it didn't work here, but it does work here. And all this did, yeah. So you learn a lot, uh, a lot more and a lot you're first, you're forced to learn a lot more because you switch every year. And I think the nicest part about consultancy is that you're getting paid to learn because, so I've been at a place where um, they had projects in Go, whereas I was a Java developer and you, they do give you the space to then learn Golang. So basically I got paid to learn Go, to learn about Google Cloud. And in the meantime, also helping the company and now I learned Go and then I go on to the next company and I can also help there and Go. And so you, you, learn much quicker as a consultant so it will definitely level up your career i think if that's sort of an answer to the question yeah i think it's answered the question um and uh, uh yeah sorry i, I was kind of interrupted ah yeah uh, what are the alter al alternatives that was the part of the question ah. so. um so alternatives to being a consultant um yeah switching jobs could be an alternative i mean you don't have to be a consultant you can also go internal um or switching teams. So especially if you start working at a bit of a larger firm where they have say different domains or some there's payment and there's fulfillment and there is um, say delivery or just thinking of things, switching teams can also be really helpful. I have colleagues who work at a bank, they're already there for four years, but each team is so completely different from the other team that it's also sort of like this new learning experience where you have different workflows, different ways uh, to commit or to um, deploy. So the alternative would be, say, switch teams, switch jobs, or um, force yourself to learn new things. Yeah, that's um, uh, yeah, that's, that to opens to up a lot of doors for my next questions. Like, uh, I t first of all, I totally agree with you uh, regarding switching teams. Uh, I had that opportunity in Atlassian where I'm working right now. So uh, that's a really good uh, good way of uh, changing the, the stack of uh, stuff that you're working on. And, uh, and it, it, also, it really helps the company, by the way, because it, even, for example, if you know more and more teams, that mean if you stay in a team, usually after a year, you're sort of at this comf comfortable level that you can you know everything and you can just start working things, just maybe even after half a year. Um, and you know the whole domain, so you know what to think about. If you then move to the next team, you also know more about integration between the two and you start seeing the bigger and the bigger picture, which makes you super valuable for your company because you, at some point, after, if you've, seen, after you've seen all the teams, you have sort of the bigger picture, which can help you grow into the role of, say, an architect. And, yeah, uh, but I can also definitely see benefits of uh, working as a uh, consultant uh, because, uh, as you mentioned before, uh, you have a better starting point if you're uh, trying to change companies. So 
comparing that to changing companies uh, on your own, uh, it's definitely much simpler solution. Yeah. Like the recruitment uh, process is much simpler, etc. Yes, definitely. I mean, the other thing, of course, would be salary. Usually, if you change jobs, that also means you get to renegotiate your salaries. That's what you don't have as a consultant. So you don't really get to, to, to uh, renegotiate your contract every time you switch. It's just part of it. Yeah. Also, like, assuming that your company is paying you uh, well, let's say. So, yeah, so typically, consultancy is paid slightly more than internal, but it really depends on the company, especially now with all the big um yeah all the big companies like the googles but also the uber the takeaway um, um Adyen, so we have lots of bank banks as well they just really pay pay really well that's good Even to hear um yeah you you mentioned one other way of uh kind of leveling up as a developer uh, pushing yourself to learn more things uh, you mentioned that you started doing presentations like four years ago how was yeah. it for you? Do you remember your first presentation and oh, yes. any hints was... you can share with us? Yeah. So what um, my first presentation, uh, just to very briefly explain it. So my first presentation, um, it started like uh, with my consultancy firm, we actually did a, a small hackathons. Um, so we went somewhere in France, we had this nice castle, we did a hackathon and I always wanted to play with a Raspberry Pi um, and just to get the lights on or something like wire things up, just, just never done it, always saw it, for oh, amazing. Um, and that got me sort of like a nice toy project, which I then sort of converted into a presentation, which was about um, how to create your custom integration for your Google Assistant, so that you could create custom commands for Google Assistant, then connect that to Raspberry Pi, and then, for example, turn on something, turn on a fan. Um, and then I have, so I was, I don't really, we have quite some people that actually are experienced at speaking, so, um, one of my colleagues is, um, I think they call it a Java champion uh, in the Java world, which is somebody who has lots of speaking experience. And he sort of helped me like, convert this to a talk. And then um, and the first, if you want to start speaking at conferences, um, they always have like these quickies, which are talks of 15. Yeah, lighting minutes. talks or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, which are a great way to start because you don't have to prepare that much. And um, usually there's a lot less people sign up for the quickies, which means you have a, a bigger chance to get in. And once you get in, you get some experience, which also show you to other conferences that you're actually able. And at some point the ball starts rolling. But I was, the first time I was super nervous. I was actually talking to a colleague about this because it was uh, at a conference very close to my hometown. And, he, and, and maybe it sounds a bit silly, but even my parents were there to just sort of, they managed to, sm uh, a colleague managed to smuggle my parents into the conference and they watched it, it was awesome. But it, <laughs> That's um, really funny. Yeah, it was totally worth it. And you learn a lot from uh, speaking because if you're creating a presentation, you're sort of forced to do 10 times more research than actually the part you're telling because you want to be prepared on questions, you want to see if it works. So you learn a lot, really a lot. Yeah, I, I remember being on one of the conferences uh, in Berlin and they had that really funny um, exercise for people who want to start talking. Uh, on the conferences, uh, they called it uh, slides karaoke, karaoke, uh, where you don't know the slides. Slides arrive uh, uh, yes. at the moment when you have to start speaking about that. I'm glad it wasn't recorded. I attended the stage, and uh, yeah, it was really fun, very stressing. But uh, but yeah, there are multiple uh, ways of actually getting into the uh, presenting uh, gig. Let's say. Yes, uh, I have uh, one question from Jack. Um, I think we kind of answered that, but I will read it anyway. Uh, should you know multiple coding languages as a consultant, uh, or you can be an expert, let's say, only with Python and be a good consultant anyway? Uh, yes, it really depends on what you want yourself. Um, I I prefer, so my main language is Java, so that's sort of my expertise, I would say. Um, but if you want to switch to, you can choose yourself to broaden or to narrow and be more specialistic about one thing. Um, and both are good consultants because company might need very specific uh, help on a specific subject. So um, say Kotlin, for example, you see now lots of companies are moving to Kotlin, but they're sort of missing the expertise. So somebody who has a very in-depth knowledge about Kotlin um, can be super helpful to teach these people how to um, properly program in Kotlin. And the same goes for Python. Um, 
So both in-depth or broaden are both very useful. So in my case, we have a team, in our team, we do four different languages. So there it's very useful to have a bit of a broader um, background, but there's also plenty of places where more in-depth plays, uh, in-depth knowledge. Also, you can, of course, you have consultants that are very specific to say uh, cloud consultancy or about data science. So it's also, it really depends on where you end up and the kind of job you choose. Cool. But for both guys. Uh, Tom is asking, uh, what is above IT consultant? So what, what, if you are an IT consultant, can you be some kind of like super <laughs> IT consultant or like, what, what is next? Or Well, that's ex actually um, an interesting question. Also just to give a bit of, uh, because it also sort of hits the, one of the, one said it's one of the downsides of consultancy is that growing is a bit weird. Um, if you join a traditional company, you sort of start in as a, maybe a junior developer and then you sort of grow, you can, there are logical steps you can take within the company, but now you switch company to new place. So the growing isn't really there. The growing would, however, you can still grow in experience. And at some point you, they may have a project which they're looking for a team lead. And that's a bit how you grow. So I mean, you still are a consultant, but you can be a consultant that is now functioning as a team lead, or maybe at some point you're a consultant for an architect position. Um, in, in the consultancy, I'm not sure if there's really a place to get higher up if you still want to go into the programming part. I mean, if you want to stop programming, you can still become a manager or something, but, uh, which is also great. Love managers, but, uh, not, yeah, that's, not that's really interesting. Like, uh, some people, uh, feel like being manager is uh, leveling up from being like the very experienced developer. Uh, but it's not for everyone. Like we have different paths for uh, development, uh, self-development, uh, def definitely. Um, definitely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> there is a funny question from Jack. Uh, when were the last time you were actually coding? When? Uh, yeah, when was the last time you, you actually touched the code and wrote some code? Uh, like, I, I, uh, I, I believe someone that... is thinking that consulting is not about writing code, but... Ah. I think it's two or three hours ago. So, um, you, so for example, actually all the places I've been, I'm just a software engineer, just like the rest. So you have a team of four developers. Now you add me, now you have a team of five developers. So it's, it really depends on the place, but I'm also just hired as a addition to the team, which means that you now have five developers instead of four. I am exactly the same as the other people in my team. Yeah. Um, so I also write code. I mean, you can be hired as a team lead, but then it's a, it's not necessarily about consultant. So consultant just does whatever his function is, and which is usually still. So in my, as my in my experience as an IT consultant, I just write code, lots of code. Um, that yeah, also I heard, I heard... after this presentation is writing more code, fixing tests, uh, just like any other developer. Yeah, I'm glad that this question arrived because uh, there are there are some misconceptions about how consultant actually works. Um, yeah, I. I think I had one extra question regarding, um, uh, I, I, I lost track of, of my thoughts. Um, yeah, oh, <laughs> uh, some companies are uh, hiring consultants because they, they cannot find within uh, the company, the developers that are capable of actually talking to customer. Have you, have you seen this kind of, uh, like atti attitude, like way of, uh, working with consultants? Um, that's an interesting one because I think that really is just uh, more of a personal trait than as a consultant. I mean, as a consultant, you're sort of forced to be more assertive because you um, you switch teams and companies, so you have to get to know more people. But not every consultant is somebody who is really um, comfortable in talking to everybody. You don't have to be super social to be a consultant. You also have plenty of people who you just join a team and they communicate within their team. They don't have to talk to customers. Um, I think it's just a gen generic skill of any software engineer of, to communicate. It doesn't, it isn't different for a consultant. No, and I definitely don't talk more to uh, customers than others do. That's all what you want yourself and how well you integrate. So, but it, again, it depends on the sort of consulting company you're working for okay. and your role. If you, if you, let's say, uh, go back uh, several years in your career, uh, will you pick the same path or uh, will you consider like doing, uh, like just joining one company, maybe let's say joining Google and uh, working there for a very, very long time between multiple teams? Uh, a good question. 
I, mm, so what I really like, so I started first at a company and I worked there for four years, but in the meantime, I was also doing my master. So I would say two years of full-time, two years of part-time. Um, I really liked that, but at some point I got bored and I'm the person that gets sort of easily bored at some point. And then I, I really liked the fact that you can just switch it up. And also because it's, I mean, it's good for your CV, for your career. Um, so it's also an investment that so far pays off. Uh, so I would definitely, I think, make the right choice. Just start somewhere internal because it is nice. I mean, actually, that's also really personal preference. I liked it because my first job was really awesome. But if you have a shitty first job, then because it's is also nice. Um, in both cases, you always learn a lot in the beginning, but at some point you sort of learn the basics and then consultancy is a bit a, a nicer way to step up because you have seen all within one company. Now you can see different companies more easily. Yeah, you, you definitely got her. Actually, you got her answers to a lot of questions that you don't know you were supposed to ask before making the choice. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I would... Uh, I will try to wrap up this discussion, maybe just ask you one more question regarding uh, work-life balance, maybe, as a consultant. Like, do you find it hard? Like, probably you can uh, encounter a lot of problems with time zone differences, maybe? Uh, yeah, interesting. Um, also, really depends on the kind of firm. So, our so Obervalue is mostly focused on Dutch customers, so you... Uh, as I'm also from the Netherlands, so we work within the same time zone, also because the Netherlands is small enough to only have one time zone. Um, so that's not really an issue here. Um, on the other hand, the nice part is, especially with working from home, is that you can also work from a foreign place, like you go to a holiday location. Then time zones can be interesting, but it's more your problem than it is uh, like any other person. Consultancy doesn't really matter there, but it depends really. You also have uh, companies which are more about product consultancy, because I think that's maybe a nice way to distinguish these different things. You can also be like a product expert. Like for example, say you're an Atlassian expert and you go to companies all around the globe to help them and or remote, then this becomes more of an issue. Or you can just be as an IT consultant in a broader sense that you're just a developer. Um, that's also, I think, a nice way to look at the, the broad versus narrow. If you're very narrow focus, then you might be wanted more over the globe than if you're very broadly uh, educated, but it's all personal, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this answer. Um... Um, so you actually asked about the work-life balance, and I think that's the same as for any other developer. I think that because the different part maybe is, is that so I now work for two companies. I work for, and in my case, for example, I work for Open Value, which is my real company. That's where I'm contracted. And I work at uh, Picnic, which is the company I'm helping. But it also means I have double the amount of activities that I can also do outside of work, and the, the double the amount of colleagues that I can meet outside of work. Um, at Open Value, for example, we also have meetups and all those things. So um, it's more easier to put more of your private time into work, but also just for the fun part of it. So not necessarily. Um, say work-life balance, if I go, uh, say, bouldering or um, drinking beers with my colleagues, is it work or is it life? That's uh, a good question, yeah. yeah. There's I, also I, plenty of space people... fun, and as a consultant, you get double the fun, basically, because you get the fun from the customer and you get your own fun. Yeah, double is... double the benefits, right? <laughs> yeah, I really like that part. I think, uh, yeah, it's awesome. So, I, I mean, at some point, I have to pick where I... I also have double the amount of offices, so I'm now in our own uh, office in Utrecht, but I can also go to the picnic office in Amsterdam. Um, and I can also work from home. So I get to pick wherever I want to be um, and I usually combine that with meeting people. So pandemic did, didn't touch you much in, in, this, in this matter, like you were able to work from home before? It, um, well, that's actually interesting. Um, the pandemic helped there in the sense that company finally switched to working remotely. So before I was actually picking, uh, because I had influence on the companies I picked, I worked at the company before that I had to drive an hour back and forth. And I was sort of done with the driving. I wanted the company as a Dutchie where I could cycle to. Um, and that was before the pandemic, it was very normal to be at the customer five days a week. And now after the pandemic, it's more common to also work from home. So, um, which gives you a lot more flexibility. And that's what I really like um, to work from anywhere. You can also go with some friends to Spain 
work from there and then in the afternoon uh, go swimming in the sea um so that's a nice thing that i think for me the the positive part of the pandemic is that companies realize that you don't have to be in the office which is also for some people works a lot better awesome like with this positive accent we can uh, wrap this up uh thank you very much for this conversation it was a pleasure to talk with you and uh, for people who are watching us uh, remember uh, next week on thursday uh, paco will present uh, at infoshare f3 conference and he will be talking about mutants actually mutation testing but uh, yeah that's it <laughs> thank you very much and uh, have a nice weekend see ya <laughs>